Asia Tech Podcast with Graham Brown and Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Hey, this is Asia Tech Podcast, Graham Brown, Michael Waits. Today, we are live on Facebook talking about the best cities in Asia to start up. This is a fantastic subject. Why did we pick this subject, Michael? Well, because – so I was thinking about this actually for a while, right? And I don't like to do rankings, no. but I did want to talk about what made things important, right? Because I hear this all the time, like Singapore has this and Australia has that. And, and maybe it's because – I met some of my friends from Australia a couple of days ago, and we were kind of sharing notes, right? I was telling them about Bangkok, and they had actually arrived from Hong Kong. So we were having this sort of three-pronged conversation about what's good. They were at the RISE conference, right, in Hong Kong, and it really just got me thinking, like, why do they do RISE in Hong Kong? Hong Kong is a tiny city, very little startup activity there. I know the people in Hong Kong are going to get mad at me. And actually, I should say this. I think by the time we're done with this, any city that we leave out of this country, we should just make a list of cities right now because any city that we leave out of this, I feel like people are going to get really mad, which is, I guess, good and bad. But I really wondered why they did the conference in Hong Kong. It's not like a hotbed for startup activity. You don't hear a lot of news coming out of it. There are a few companies that are good, but no gigantic companies have come out of there. Mm-hmm. And then also I was reading over the weekend, I believe, as well, that the launch festival, so something done by you know Jason Calacanis and his team, I, I believe they do it twice a year in San Francisco, um, they just announced that they're doing it on Australia. So they've committed to two years in Australia, I believe, if I've read the news correctly, 2018 and 2019. And it just got me thinking, like, why Australia? Mm. And I'm sure they've got great reasons why, right? There's a, maybe there's a, a close connectivity between what's going on there and what's going on in the United States. Maybe, they, you know, maybe there are people that they know there. Maybe the RISE people just thought that the facilities in Hong Kong were better. But I really wanted to start thinking about what was it exactly that made a startup city great, mm. right? And I think it's not necessarily only country-specific, right? Because you can go to Sweden and Stockholm is amazing, right? So Stockholm had what? Spotify and... Yeah, there's another there's another billion dollar company that, and Skype actually I believe came out of Sweden as well. Um, but to be fair, there haven't been a ton of companies coming out of Sweden in a while, so it'll be interesting to see what happens there, right? But I think it's more city specific than country mm-hmm. specific, sure. and to a certain extent, the country laws make a big difference. But to the extent that any country can create a special economic zone or give any city a special deal. Um, then maybe there's a reason why the cities matter, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I tried to make a list to myself of like what really mattered, and the list just started getting longer and longer. And I really wanted to talk tonight about, I don't know, 10 cities or 8 cities or whatever it was, and it just isn't enough time. Yeah. Right? Because so I we're, we're going to piss some people off, right, by not mentioning their city, but... D- definitely, and... and you know, at the end, so there are going to be places we won't really spend a lot of time talking about, and I think, you know, I could say the biggest... Thing we won't spend a lot of time talking about is KL, but that's not really true because Jakarta as well. Mm. And I really just wanted to pick representative cities. And you know, to be fair, if somebody wants to jump in and ask a question about a specific place that we're not talking about, please feel free to do so. And, and Graham, obviously, you know, we can just veer off as well. Yeah, yeah. But I want to talk about I want to talk about some of the things that I thought were important, and then maybe we can go in general terms, and then maybe we can go and talk about how a few of the cities break down for some of those things. Right. So the first. Mm was just population. You know, how many people are there? Right? Do you want to do a startup or is it does it even scale to do a startup in a place where there just aren't that many people? Yeah. Um, and does language matter? Right? So if you're sitting in Okinawa or if you're sitting in Hokkaido, right, you're in Japan, do you need to know how to speak English? Right. Like do you have visions to move your company outside of Japan? There are 126 million people in Japan, but Do you want to move it out? So does language matter? I think it does actually, right? Mm. And also, what are your other choices? Do you want to do a startup or do you want to go work for Goldman Sachs? Right, I mean, that was always one of the biggest problems with making New York a hotbed for activity was that the banking sector was just so big there and advertising, offline advertising, right? Like Mm. mainline advertising was so big. Well, that's also a a weakness of Hong Kong maybe as well, isn't it? I mean, the financial sector is so strong in Hong Kong. Why would you give up a, a lucrative career in investment banking to go and start a startup. Yeah, I mean, that was exactly why I wanted to talk about Hong Kong later. And that, that's actually one of the things that got me thinking about Rise, right? And in Hong Kong as well, 
Real estate's a gigantic business. Yeah. Manufacturing, because it's so close to the new territories and to Shenzhen. So, again, you know, those things matter when you're trying to decide whether you're going to build a startup or even just leave your job and do a startup, right? And then there was, you know, logistics and infrastructure, right? So even if you build a startup, how do people pay for your product? You know, how do things work? Infrastructure. So, like, how fast is the internet? Is the internet reliable? I think Bali might have a problem with that, right? And exactly. I haven't been to Bali in a few years, but Bali's beautiful. should be the perfect place for it. It's part of Indonesia. It's really centralized for in Asia as well. But for some reason, every time I've been there, the internet just hasn't been so fast, right? I think and you're also, being diplomatic. It's lousy. Is it still? I haven't been in a while, so I didn't want to comment. Right. But, but they, they put a lot of money into those co-working spaces like down in Hubert, but I'm sure we'll talk about this. But, you know, how important co-working spaces are in the general picture of startups, right? Yeah, and I mean, I think they're really important. They're on my list too because it's the community that gets built around the startup, yeah. right? I like to say... Nobody succeeds alone, yeah. right? And there are plenty of people that try, and it doesn't really matter like how brilliant you are or how talented you are. You just no one succeeds alone, right? So co-working spaces, and then I was thinking also, well, as well, like banking and finance matter, rail systems, air transport, mm -hmm. airports. These things really matter, right? You know, how convenient is it in to, to get in and out? And then also corporates. I don't think a lot of people talk about this, right? But are the sort of proximate, so the close by corporations, are they supportive mm. or do they, do they obstruct you? In other words, do they look at what you're doing and then try to take your IP and invest against you? Or do they invest realizing that they can't, and because they have legacy systems internally, do they say, oh, we'll never be able to beat these guys, so let's invest in them and then we'll buy them later, or somebody will buy them later, right? And then there's talent, so how much talent is there in any particular city? And if the talent isn't there, can they get there, right? It, it, will the immigration rules allow them to get there? So this is a government thing, right? And what's yeah. the cost of living? So I'm sure there are plenty and plenty of jobs in San Francisco, but where are you going to live? And even, I believe, Singapore, we'll talk about this later, but yeah. Singapore's this as well, right? I mean, I don't want to blow my cover for this completely, but consumer prices in Singapore are 63% higher than they are in Bangkok. Yeah. That's just a fact, and that's not, that's not my opinion. And I've got a whole bunch of these facts we can talk about, right? So how does that play out in the context of is this a great place to build a startup or not? Well, that's right? particularly relevant to a startup, isn't it? Because it's all burn time. That's like and, yeah. half the burn time in Singapore as you get in Bangkok, right? Yeah, and then think about rent. So rent in Singapore is 97% higher than it is in Bangkok, yeah, yeah. right? Oh, no, no, CPI is higher in total, but rent is like almost double. 174 percent higher yeah it just it keeps going right so and you're right it's really important for a startup because your burn matters and even if you're not renting an office you're renting an apartment you have to live somewhere yeah. and that cost is expensive too right and then a few other things right so investors how do you fund yourself it, are there angel investors there are there seed investors follow on and it, a whole concept that we talk about but we should talk about more is this thing re risk capital right so mm. I have money that I'm willing to lose versus just capital. I just have a lot of money. Right? Because there are plenty of people in plenty of cities where there's a lot of money and not a lot of risk capital. And I think, to be fair, Japan actually falls into that category. Very much so. Right? And we'll talk Very about safe. why why there's not a super vibrant startup um, ecosystem in Tokyo, but maybe yeah. there would be in one of the smaller cities. And we'll get to that smaller city later, right? Exactly. Um. And here's the, here's the, um, the red herring, one of the red herrings for me, right? So there's also the, what I call creating value out of your investment dollars. And that really is, I don't like to use the word exit, right? But how are your investors going to make money, right? So can they IPO? Can there be a trade sale? Is there just mergers and acquisitions where one really successful startup buys a bunch of smaller startups and rolls them up into a much larger entity? We saw that happen in Southeast Asia already, right? So the Insogo boys did that. Um, Groupon actually tried to do it, and you saw it happen um, with some of the e-commerce sites as well. So you definitely saw, you know, Bilna merged with What's New, and they created Moxie as well, and then it turned into Orami. So there's been some of that, but not a lot of monetization and sort of exits for um, your investors. But the reality is that most of the ecosystems out here in Asia have really only been around for 
five to seven years. Mm. And most investments kind of take that a period of time to actually gestate and turn into money. Right. So we're really at the beginning of working out whether or not those investments are coming around, right? It's too right. early really to get a long-term picture on these ecosystems. It is too early. So the presumption is, right, that it, let's just say that I live in Thailand, right? So let's say the Thai ecosystem started in force in 2012. Mm -hmm. It's just the beginning of 2017. So we're only four years really in. And I, I believe strongly there's been a lot of progress. But the fact that there's been no exit per se, and we can talk about Lazada because it has been purchased pretty much outright by Alibaba. Um, and there have been some other exits as well in the region, but not, not gigantic, right? But the point is, we're not there yet. So if you hear investors say, I don't want to invest in Southeast Asia yet because I don't know where my exit's going to be and there's going to be no IPO. You know, my answer to that has always been onefold, which is really, it's too early. But second of all, if you are going to make the connection to the global infrastructure for your startup, for your financing, and all the other sort of important things that make a startup city vibrant, the reality is that most of the IPOs that take place and most of the mergers take place are going to happen in the United States. Hmm. That's just a fact. I mean, Alibaba, in and of itself, right, I don't believe they did their, and I don't know this for sure, right, but Alibaba, I believe, did their initial IPO in Hong Kong. And you can comment that Hong Kong is China, but it's not clear to me what Hong Kong actually is. Like, I don't know if you have an opinion on this, right? I know it's part of China. It's still, I believe, a special administrative region. Is that true? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. An, SA, an SAR? Officially. But what that means, yeah, officially, right? Um, but I think it's really interesting to me that when they listed, they didn't list in, um, in Shenzhen or in, in, mm -hmm. in Shanghai. But they listed in Hong Kong. And there are reasons for that, too. And when they did their ADR, they did a $23 billion ADR, a $21 billion ADR, and they did it on the New York Stock Exchange. And, yeah. and you know, a lot of that has to do with image, too. But the point is that if you're an Israeli company building a mapping solution and you get bought by Google, you just move your thing to Menlo Park. You move to Silicon Valley, right? So no one lists on the Israeli Stock Exchange. I mean, not nobody, but very few people do. But nobody, right. says, that, nobody says that Israel doesn't have a vibrant... You know, the Tel Aviv doesn't have a vibrant tech startup ecosystem. It does by definition. And they've been in this longer than we have been in Asia. So fair enough. And the last thing are the regulations. And the list is long, right? But the last thing really is the regulations. Like, is your intellectual property protected? What's the tax structure? What's the, you know, what's the entire legal infrastructure? Is it easy to set up a company? Is it hard to set up a company? And almost more importantly, is it easy to unwind a company? Hmm. Right, I mean, one of the big benefits, if you read some of these really large um, analyses of Silicon Valley and even of some of the places in, um, in Europe, they'll say, you know, starting is easy, failing is easy, and unwinding is easy. So there's not a lot of residual um, responsibility left. If you do fail, and a lot of companies obviously are going to fail. We know the statistics there, right? Something like 80% or more of startup companies are going to fail. So there sh it should be easy to unwind. And then I didn't put this in my notes, but I wanted to remind myself to talk about it. There's a real cultural aspect around failure, mm. right? You tell me, you, you, live, in, you live in Japan. Um, oh, what's, yeah. what's the culture there around failure? Well, I believe debts follow you around until you're underground, right? They and do, I, though, right? That's the problem. And a lot of people, I think, are very averse and very shy of failure because of that. There's no, there's no ability simply to walk away from your debt, even though officially that may be the case. I think your debtors will hound you until your dying days. And then yeah. I, they'll turn up at your family home and they'll, they'll use the, the honor leverage, shame you in front of your family and your relatives. Exactly. And your, exactly. you know, the worst thing would be in front of your fiance's family and stuff like that, right? So that's how it works. So there is a real cultural adversity to debt. And I think it's the same across a lot of Asia, right? I mean, we talked about this in one of those stories about that Thai weightlifter. I'm not sure if we talked yeah. about it on air, right? I don't think we did, but we talked right. about it off. And I, I think you're right, yeah? She, she, I mean, the story was that she, she won Olympic gold, but the only reason she said she won Olympic gold was because she changed her name in a previous life, so to speak. She had started business and failed, and that had hounded her and the only reason she could get out of that was by changing her name. Wow. So I think it's an Asian thing, right? I mean, Asia is, is a hotbed of entrepreneurial activity, but yeah, there's still some attitudes that hang over that whole failure thing, right? 
Right. And there's got to be a way to get around it, right? Because the yeah. entire culture is not going to change. And frankly, I'm not advocating and I don't think you are either. The question is, how do you make a really strong startup city inside of inside of that culture? Mm. Right? And that's not the only part of the culture as well, right? I mean, there's a whole bunch of other great parts of it, but that's just one part that makes it slightly more difficult. Anyway, so I wanted to talk about city by city, or at least a few cities. And this is maybe where we'll start going to maybe make some people mad or at least Mm-hmm. understand what their opinions and their biases are. And I always like to talk to people about this, right? I like to introduce my own bias before I start talking about what my opinion is, right? So I used to live in Japan, so I feel like I have a little bit of a bias about Japanese things and Japanese institutions and the culture, but I've lived in Thailand for almost six years now, right? And I've made a deep investment into the Southeast Asian tech ecosystem. So I almost feel like I have to defend it at some level, but the reality is that with even with that bias, I'm pretty fair-minded, I think, about what's good and what's bad. And actually, going through all of the research that I did um, while I was thinking about uh, talking about this, you know, what's happened in Singapore is nothing short of amazing. Just what the government's done mm. has just been insane, right? Anyway, let's start with Bangkok. Right? I live in Bangkok. Let's talk about size. We talked about population. So Bangkok is about 8 million-odd people. I think it's probably more, but I wanted to use the same statistical source for every city. Let's just use that. And Thailand is about 70 million people. So, right. So again, the population in Bangkok is pretty well sized. There are enough people here, I think, to be able to, to have a, a good swath of experiences, but also a good level of, of talent as well. And just great backgrounds, different backgrounds. Right. So people can actually um, contribute at different levels. But also Thailand itself is a big enough country, 70 million people, where if you build something, it's success or failure is actually relevant, right? So size is good. We talked about co-working spaces. I mean, there are just tons of them. And that's, you know, in Bangkok, I can go through a few of them. The Hive, yeah. I've, actually, I've actually worked there. I was a member there for over a year. It's a pretty amazing space. We'll find out that the Hive is actually throughout Asia. Hubba is a kind of a pioneer in the co-working space in Thailand. It's a great co and that's that's important, isn't it? That's very well connected and Im- embedded in the ecosystem there, isn't it? With all the startup events and Yep, I think those guys try really hard. That whole yeah. team tries really hard and they've been doing this for years, right? And when I say pioneer, I mean it. When they started, people were wondering yeah. what is that White House in yeah. Ekamai doing? What are you guys doing over there? Um, and they've been followed. So there's the work loft, there's launchpad, there's igloo. And there's also an igloo branch in Chiang Mai, which we can talk about later. And I believe there's one called Glow as well. But I mean, I can just go on and on and on. There is a co-working, there's a co-working ecosystem in, in Bangkok that really matters. And frankly, if you just walk around the halls of them, you'll, all you do is bump into entrepreneurs. Hmm. And they're all building like really interesting companies and they're all trying to do things you know, in the startup space. It's, just, it's a great ecosystem here. So it checks that box in a way. We talked a little bit about internet speeds earlier. Um, again, I'm biased here. The research that I did says, on average, the internet speeds in Bangkok are about 9.3 megabits per second. But true, in AIS, I'm not as sure about DTAC because I don't I don't use it. Um, but the two of the biggest com- two of the biggest mobile companies here, they just blanket the city with Wi-Fi. So everywhere you go, there's either a true access point or an AIS access point. And I was joking around with someone that I know in San Francisco this week. Because they were making fun of the the Thai speeds, you know. I actually think they said twenty six k twenty six baud modem. Hmm. So I said, okay, that's pretty funny. But let me just take a screenshot of me. I didn't I didn't want to be really snarky because I could have taken a screenshot of me getting three hundred and fifty megabits. But I thought that was a little <laughs> bit rude. But on average, what I see for myself is about twenty five megabits up and down. Right. I think it's important it's, to say that about Thailand, isn't it? It's pretty advanced when it comes to internet speeds for what it is as an economy right compare yeah. it to say indonesia or vietnam you yeah know, it's, it's pretty square. amazing so the the true the true um you know mobile mobile phone operation company who provides internet service as well um and i'm sure ais is the same but i use true mostly so i know them better but this the internet speeds you get for them just in a random coffee shop is like 25 to 30 megabits it's everywhere and they want to dominate that space and it's just yeah you're right it's insanely amazing um and if you don't know that it just means you haven't been here right and to a certain extent i always feel like you can win as a city or as a person the moment you're underestimated by somebody 
Does that make sense? In other words, if people don't think you have what you already have, you're going to be able to win in a bunch of different ways because people will be surprised by your outperformance. And I think we're going to just keep seeing that in Thailand over the next five to 10 years. And the the internet speeds are something that the, the city and the country has done really well. But, you know, in Bangkok, I don't, I don't really worry about internet speeds at all. And frankly, I went to a restaurant today to have lunch their internet, like their box was not working. And I just literally went to a restaurant next door and I had the 25 megabits that I needed and I did a bunch of work there. Universities and education is important here. Chula, Chula Long Kron, so one of the best schools in Thailand is in Bangkok and have the Sassin School of Business, um, which is really an amazing MBA program and a really great business school. And to be fair, there are a lot of foreign professors actually come and are visiting professors there. And some of that curriculum, or if not all of it, is in English as well. And that gets back to the language that we talked about too. But other universities, Tamasat is great, Mahidon and King Mangkut's University of Technology. There are a few branches of that, but plenty of educational support um, for tra- for traditional education. Um, and then we talked about corporate. What's the corporate support here? Keep going. We had a bit of te- techno fun there. That's good. Technology fun. That's what we do. We do. So you're talking about internet, you see. So yeah, it's great, right? Um, so what what kind of corporate support do you have in Bangkok? Well, it's pretty good, right? And it, it's across the board, right? So you have SCB, so Sam Commercial Bank uh, runs their own digital ventures, right? You have AIS, so Invent by InTouch is here. True and Cube. Loxley via the K2 Ventures and SCG runs something called, called AdVentures. I could go on and on about this too. You have government support. And the government has just announced at the beginning of this year kind of a $570 million public-private investment program to facilitate the startup ecosystem. They'll be working mm. in conjunction with some of the startup spaces and also some of the mobile operators to build spaces where startups can be incubated. And they're going to put you know, three, 400 megabits per second up and down of internet in those places so that startups can have, you know, world-class speeds there. Well, that's okay, cool. just explain to me, Michael. I mean, you know, as an outsider looking in, I mean, if you look at Thailand, yeah, it's a developing economy and not really anything re- resembling what we know as democracy, et cetera, et cetera, all those kind of common criticisms. Why is it so hot when it comes to startup support and internet? What's going on? Look, I mean, the the the, the country as a whole is very focused on um, on its economy. It always has been. I mean, if you go back all the way to the 40s and 50s, you'll see that the Thai government has been incredibly focused on growing the Thai economy in a way that benefits all of the Thai people. It's really been quite quite, quite well done, frankly, um, and. You know, we can comment about the politics pretty much in any country, I think, in the, right, right. In the world. And it's, you know, it's both good and bad. But the one thing you cannot, you can't say about the governments here is that they're not focused on growing the economy. And in the midst of any other issues that they may be dealing with, and fair enough, every country has their own issues. What's going on here is they're just very interested in making this a world-class country. And that makes Bangkok a world-class city. And like I said, I was with... Um, a couple of my friends from Australia over the weekend and they had come from Hong Kong and they were just amazed mm. at just the change. They had, I believe they hadn't been here in two or three years and they were just amazed at the changes that they'd seen. Right. And we, again, we sat at dinner somewhere and we were on the true Wi-Fi, and it was blazing fast. Oh yeah. Faster than when they get back in Australia for sure. Way faster, way faster, and they were, and, and they loved that, right? And these, these are also investors and, and venture capitalists as well. So yeah. we're talking the same language. But the, maybe the greatest thing about Bangkok is the cost of living. Okay, so I like to have, you know, some people have what they call the McDonald's index. I'm going to use what I call the one bedroom apartment index. Okay, mm-hmm. it costs twenty thousand baht a month on average for a, a, a like a perfectly fine central city one bedroom apartment. 20,000 baht. It's about $600 depending on, and I'm rounding, right? But it's definitely less than $700 a month to have a perfectly modern, well-appointed, in almost most cases, furnished apartment. That's just really cheap. How would that compare to New York or San Francisco? Let's do it with San Francisco if we're going to talk about startup cities because it must be pretty outrageous there. What sort of well, factor? In San Francisco, I believe, and I'm just talking off the top of my head, right? But it's not that hard to figure out. Let's just do this. Average rent right. in – no, it's easy. San 
Francisco, right, one bedroom. I believe it's probably in the three thousand to four thousand dollar range. Yeah, maybe somebody can tweet us if they know the exact answer. Yep. No, Francisco one bedroom apartment fell to three thousand five hundred dollars a month. That's an out, you five know, times. Yeah, it's just five times, maybe six times more expensive there than it is here. And believe me, the lifestyle here is way better than it is there for sure. And I can have all the people from San Francisco argue with me, but the weather here is way better. Full stop. Bar none. Oh. Um, anyway, so I, you know, like I said, I went through and I got a lot of data on this. But it, what it does is it makes Bangkok a really great city for startups. And we're only kind of four and a half, five years into the ecosystem here. We'll have more co-working spaces. We'll have more risk capital. There's plenty of capital here. We talk about it a lot, but there's not a lot of risk capital, which means that the local venture capital scene is not great. And you're just starting to get your first bit of angel investors that are really committed. There are some that are taking a real index view on investing here, but it's one of the things that makes it a good um, startup city, and that is there are angels with a decent amount of money who are saying, you know what, give it your best shot. I'll give you 25 or 50 grand. And they've been really good about it. Um, Does the I mean, fact I, that that Bangkok is a cheap location in contrast to in comparison to San Francisco mean that somebody could move there, bootstrap the business without seed funding, or without a lot, you know, with maybe using their own seed funding, their own bank account, they could bootstrap a business and then later on go and seek later rounds of finance. Is is that a possibility now that they don't need a huge overhead to get the business rolling? Yeah. So here's the thing. If you're, a, if you're an Asian entrepreneur, right, and you've gone to the United States and succeeded or just gone to the United States or just gone to Europe and had like a full time employment and you've saved a decent amount of money, a hundred or two hundred thousand right. dollars, there's absolutely nothing stopping you from coming to Bangkok, having an apartment for 20,000 baht a month, which is six hundred dollars or seven hundred dollars. And bootstrapping your company because if you can take remember in a world of digital nomads right which we haven't even spent any time mm -hmm. talking about Chiang Mai or the Bali stuff or even Phuket but in a world of digital nomads where people are coming and going and those people are highly qualified and also remote working you can definitely do that definitely and I know a lot of people that have tried as well um, and those are you know Israelis and that live in the United States but then come here with a, a little bit of money saved and they, they try to run their businesses from here but at some point, remember, if they want to have an exit or if they want to grow really large or get global investment, they used to go back to the U.S. to do that. And I'm actually seeing some of the reverse activity. I do speak to people in the United States mm -hmm. who are Asian, and they say, what I want to do is take everything that I've learned and come back to Thailand. Right? So I, I believe, if I have the company right, the CEO of Honest Be, mm. a guy who used to be the CEO of What's New, so the Moxie business in Thailand, has gone off and done another startup, but his most of his startup experience, he's Thai, right? And most of his startup experience was in, I believe, in Boston. Right. Right. So that's a great example that you come back, you don't need to make as much, and I'm not, I don't know his salary, right? But you don't need to make as much money as you used to, and you can come here and you can bootstrap. It's really a great way to do it. And then by the time you get traction or you're running a great business, um, you, you're already set up. It's so much easier to get investment when mm. your business is already up and running. And frankly, when you've already committed to funding most of it, right? Yeah, for sure. Right. So that's really super, actually. Um, let's talk about another, let's talk about another um, city. So Sydney. And mm. again, I thought about Sydney because I was with my friends over the weekend. And, and again, in their defense, they're not from Sydney. <laughs> they're uh, from Melbourne. Melbourne, exactly. They're, they're from Melbourne, which is, again, a hotbed of it. It's a different its world. It's a completely different world, and there's a great startup ecosystem there, and no disservice or no disrespect to Melbourne, but you talk about a global audience, and most of the global audience is going to know Sydney better, and I really just wanted to talk about Australia but in the context why, of the Why of the world. Sydney, of all the places? It, I mean, yeah, go on. Explain yourself. Why Sydney? Well, yeah, well, just, again, because if I said Melbourne, Australia, first of all, most people mispronounce it. Second of all, most <laughs> people don't even know it's there, um, which is too bad since it's, by all accounts, it's a beautiful city. Um, and it runs a great, some of the best startups are actually from Melbourne, right? I mean, if you know anything about the genesis of the tech startup ecosystem in Australia, you know that one of the earliest sort of internet companies in the world, two of them came out of Melbourne. Yeah. So I think one of them was called Sausage Software, which, you know, no jokes, please. And the other one was called Interweb or Intercompany. I can't remember what it was, but yeah. Um, 
But let's just talk about let's talk about the biggest city in Australia, which is Sydney, four point nine million people. But again, unlike Thailand, Australia only has twenty three million people in it, hmm. right? But they have built out co working spaces. There's a there's actually a space there called Spaces, so they get zero points for creativity. <laughs> um, we work, which I believe is an American company, that's global now, and you'll see that they're everywhere yep. in the region. Tank Stream Labs, the Engine Room, Fish Burners, and there are a whole bunch of other ones, right? Um, so they have that nailed too. But it, the internet speeds, I thought, were interesting. It's only 8.3 megabits per second, and if you go back to Thailand, it's less than it is in Thailand. And I don't, and that's on average, right? Which means that there are places where it's much lower. And I don't know, but Telstra is the biggest phone company in Australia, right? I don't know what their competition is like, but in general, the more competition, the better the mobile Wi-Fi speeds are going to be, mm-hmm. meaning, meaning the Wi-Fi that the companies provide are going to be better. I, mean, I just don't have an edge on what that's like, right? But just the regular internet speeds there are slightly slower and definitely slower than the global average as well, I believe. You've got to talk um, about cost of living, though, when you come to Sydney. I mean, Yeah, uh, let me get, that's the last thing we talk about, right? That's part oh, of the index. We'll the talk to yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. I actually want to get that thing up in a second, so just give me a second there. Do, 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 do. Um, but, you know, from a university and education standpoint, nailed as well. The educational system in Australia is fabulous, right? Mm-hmm. University of Sydney, Macquarie University, University of New South Wales, and University of um, the Sydney University of Technology are all really strong places. There's corporate VC there, although not as much as there is. And part of the reason, I think, is some of the government stuff. So there's AMP, New Ventures, NAB Ventures, Reinventure, and Telstra. And we'll start to see a pattern in the region. And the region is, and part of the pattern is that a lot of the telcos, the mobile telcos, know that they're moving down yeah. the street like they're just going to be a dump pipe. I hate to say it, but unless they can find some bigger services to add on, third party services to add on, they run the risk of being disintermediated by services that use their data stream. And they're going to be some of your biggest corporate venture capitalists, not just in Australia, but you already saw it in um, in Thailand. So then the government, right? The government in Australia as well is trying. is trying to move in the right direction, but there are tax issues in Australia. Mm. If my knowledge of the tax situation in Australia is correct, even for a startup, as it increases in value, there's a tax liability for, you know, from seed round to series a and then follow on rounds i believe um, although i'm not 100 percent sure that there are tax liabilities that exist in australia for startup investors right and this is the big problem mm-hmm. um that don't necessarily exist in the rest of the world and it's a slight disincentive for people to do their startup there and you do see companies start up in australia and then move their offices literally to san francisco and for them it's easy language is the same right so again get back to this question of language Speaking English, easy to move to Australia, easy to move to San Francisco. If you're from Sydney, you have generally four seasons as well. So going to California or Boston or New York, where there are four seasons, is not a big change for you. Um, and the government has, like I said, they have support for incubators and stuff like that. But the tax issues are something that's going to have to get handled. Now, the cost of living in Sydney is probably higher than it is in um, in Singapore, mm. right? So if it costs six hundred dollars. A month to rent a one-bedroom apartment in Bangkok and three thousand five hundred in San Francisco. It's two thousand six hundred approximate dollars in Sydney. But restaurants and food and everything else is going to be two times more expensive than it is in Bangkok for sure. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's just going to—it's just going to get in the way. Right? And while the internet allow, in my mind, right, and this is an opinion, but in my mind. A country like Australia, right, while it has a really great and vibrant startup ecosystem, and Sydney is is really a fabulous place, it's very expensive to live there, and it's really far away, right? Mm -hmm. So what you're left with is, there's a lot of risk capital there, which is good, but again, that capital kind of gets disintermediated by some of the tax issues there. A lot of the people that would would invest there either invest in other countries, right, so set up a fund in Israel or set up a fund in California, so they'll take the money that they've earned there and move it offshore. Um, but you only, your market, your home market's really only 20-something million people. So in a way, it's very similar to Malaysia. You see a lot of companies there move out of the country to go, to go somewhere else. And I can, I can name some of them, but you know, it's pretty easy to see their addresses are in San Francisco or New York or somewhere in the United States. 
Do you think do Sydney you think- as well suffers in a similar way to maybe Hong Kong in the sense that there's a lot of very strong incumbent industries, isn't there? You've got mining off on the West Coast in Perth. You've got construction, agriculture, tourism. You know, there's a lot of money to be made in these industries, not being a startup entrepreneur, right? Yeah, I mean, given given the choice, right, would you rather go work for Rio Tinto where you kind of know you're going to be employed forever as they sell coke and coal and iron or whatever it is to the Chinese, which they've been doing for 20 years, or try to go do a startup? Mm. Um, yeah, you're right. And there's banking. So Macquarie, NAB, even ANZ has big offices. Like they're just big companies there. Re- there's been a real estate boom in Sydney for 20 years as well. So are you in construction? Are you in interior design? There are plenty of other choices there. Yeah, I do think it struggles from the same, suffers from the same thing. And you could even make, what, 15 bucks an hour serving tables, isn't it? Min- <laughs> minimum wage? I have no idea what the minimum wage is in right. Sydney. I think it's 15, but I, I don't know. Somebody can tweet us and let us know. But. but I'll tell you, it's more than it is in Bangkok where it's 300 baht a day. Right, there you go. It's $10 a day, a day. Okay, so yeah, it's cheap. Um, I wanted to talk about your home territory a little bit, right? This is a little bit of an outlier, I think, because most people don't think of like if you think about Japan, you're thinking Kyoto, Tokyo, Osaka, yeah, maybe at the Hokkaido, most. Iseko yeah. if you ski, right? But that's at the most. If you even know, most people don't even know like Kyoto as a city. They just think of it as a place to go see temples, right? Yeah. But the one place they definitely don't know <laughs> is in Kyushu, <laughs> mm-hmm. and that's and that's Fukuoka. Okay, let's talk about population size. So there's 1.48 million, almost 1.5 million people in Fukuoka. And Japan itself has 126 million people. So there's a massive market there. And there are something like 5 million, yeah, it makes sense. There's only 5 million SMEs in Japan, maybe 6 million, right? So there's a lot of kind of middle of the road businesses that need a ton of technology, a ton of startup stuff there, right? Co-working spaces. I thought this was really interesting when I was looking at it. I could find a total of three co-working spaces in Fukuoka. Wow. That's about right, yeah. Yeah, it's about and it's it's interesting, right? And one of them, Startup Cafe, was one that's sponsored by the Startup City Fukuoka, which is, you know, a program run by the governor of Fukuoka. And you know, it's just really interesting that there are only two of them there. <laughs> Think about it. I, I mean, there are two of them within like I'd say a kilometer of where I live in Bangkok, at least two, maybe five. Okay, internet speeds are pretty good in Japan, 17.4 megabits per second, so not bad. In Fukuoka, there are plenty of universities, Fukuoka University, Kyushu, Fukuoka Institute of Technology. Um, And the corporate VC infrastructure is really interesting in Japan. In Fukuoka, it's probably almost non-existent, right? In the city itself. It's not the capital. It's not the second largest city. It's not even the third largest city in the country. So I, I don't, and, and it's not a big hotbed for industry either. So you'd have to be in Nagoya, right, or in Aichi for people that are familiar with the, mm-hmm. the geography of Japan. And in Tokyo, obviously, there's going to be plenty, right? So from a corporate perspective, there's Mirai Creation Investment. The name itself doesn't really mean it. I mean, it means something, future creation, right? But Toyota. One of the big banks are involved in Sparks, and Sparks has always been sort of a small boutique um, alternative investment house, very successful. There's a biopharma fund started by a corporate called Sose, and then Nikon, so Nikon, the camera company and lens company, in conjunction with SBI Innovation Fund, and then, of course, the elephant in the room is SoftBank, and then a couple of the banks. A lot of the banks actually run venture capital funds in Japan, not to mention all of the telcos, KDDI Ventures, um, Docomo Ventures, right now, obviously SoftBank. And the other interesting thing is that a lot of the LPs, and I was reading some articles on this, right? It's the, the VC world in Japan is fundamentally a corporate venture capital. So whereas in the United States, and even in, even in Thailand and in the rest of Southeast Asia, you have this, the rest of Asia, so you have this concept. There are plenty of LPs that are institutions or high net worth individuals or other people other than corporations. But in Japan, it's very corporate. Right, so it gives mm. it a completely different feel. Um, it suits, I'm, isn't it? It suits rather than jeans. Yeah, it's plenty of suits. Yeah, it's plenty of suits. And even if you go to the interesting thing is, I've been to two or three tech conferences in Japan. One of them was held at the Tokyo Stock Exchange, which I thought was fascinating. 
Mm -hmm. Um, Like, why? Mm -hmm. That was to give it gravitas, right? Right. Um, And the other one was in Kyoto, which in and of itself doesn't really have a big startup scene at all, but maybe just because it was cheaper to put people there and easier to organize because it's much smaller. I didn't really understand, but the B Dash guys put it there. Maybe they, I think they do it in a different city every year, but it was there. Um, but I think it's really important to talk about what's going on in Fukuoka from a government perspective, mm. right? This whole concept of the startup cafe, the startup visas, right? And you've got the mayor there, this guy, Takashima, mm-hmm. who wants to, and has done this actually over the past five or so years, he's lowered taxes there. He's given foreigners visas much, much easier in a, in a country where it's traditionally been very, very hard to get a visa. What right? do you think of these visas? $50,000, two permanent employees. It's, I mean, it's pretty strict for a visa, but compared to what it was before, it's, it's a step forward, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's a step in the right direction. And remember, I, I bet if you talk to this guy, Takashima, in private, he would say, I would give anybody, you know, to a qualified investor or right. to a qualified startup guy, I give it for them to them for free. Right, right, right. But I've got a lot of group pressure, not just from my city, but from my prefecture and from my country to just make it a little bit more expensive. And again, to be fair, to incorporate a company in Thailand, you need two million baht of um, paid in capital. It's about sixty thousand dollars, and you need to employ four people. So right. it's about the same. Not that, yeah, yeah, it's not that different. Um, but in, but in Japan, this is like a watershed event because mm-hmm. just being a foreigner in Japan and getting a visa is hard. Right. Without right. a sponsor, right? This is the key, isn't it? To be able to get a yeah. visa without a sponsor on the inside. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, when I, so when I lived in Japan, I was always there, you know, on, on a corporate business visa. And it was it was easy, but I'll tell you what, the first time I renewed, it was for three years. And the next three times, it was for a year each. Mm. <laughs> And that was, you know, working for Morgan Stanley or whatever. So it was never easy. Okay. Now, now, the interesting thing is that the cost of living in Fukuoka is actually not bad either. Right. So we get to the sort of one-bedroom apartment index, and Fukuoka is only about 90,000, 89,000 baht, baht, yen a month. It's about $900. Mm-hmm. So not, well, it's 50% more expensive than Bangkok. But much less expensive than it is in, um, we'll get to Singapore in a second, but much less expensive than it is in Singapore and much less expensive than it is in Sydney as well. The thing, though, about Japan, right, is it culturally, right, so the city itself, Fukuoka, sounds like a great place to do a startup. There are actually international schools there, too, so the schooling system's not going to be that bad. Those things, you know, and there's, there's plenty of money in Japan, but like we said, not a lot of risk capital, yeah? Mm. So Fukuoka is a good experiment, I think, for Japan. Um, I was in Fukuoka a year ago, I believe, and I'll probably be back again this year too. And last year it wasn't for this reason, but this year it probably will be. I want to go see what it's like there. I want to go into the co-working spaces. I want to talk to some of the entrepreneurs, both the Japanese entrepreneurs and the foreigners, just to see what they feel like, right? In other words, why are you there? Mm -hmm. I really want to find out from them, like, what, in your mind, what do you think makes um, Fukuoka a great startup city? It'll be interesting to see, right? Yeah. It seems to me, from what I know, the startups in Fukuoka, it seems to be they're there because they have to have a connection with Japan. I mean, you could you could have a startup in Thailand without necessarily selling to the Thai market, couldn't you? You could sell all the markets abroad, whereas you couldn't really do that in Fukuoka. There would be no benefit in being based there. No, nah, so, not really. As, as a matter of fact, yeah, it's a good point, yeah? Sorry, I interrupted you. No, no, I think that's... So you look at the startups that are there, they are there because they need to be in Japan. It just so happens to be the cheapest and best place to be in Japan for that kind of business. But isn't that one of the catch-22s actually about being a startup in Japan in general? Is yeah. that, and I've spoken to some of them, right? And I've asked them, right? Like you go to their websites and you go to their mobile, like it's all in Japanese. Yeah. With the idea that the, the domestic market is big enough that they don't have to think globally. But boy, you start a, you start a business in Thailand and the moment you start getting any kind of business, you're thinking, when can I expand into the rest of the region and when can I necessarily expand globally? I think, they, I think the companies here, you know, whether it's Singapore, Sydney, Hong Kong, all th- and Bangkok, I think they all think about that right away. It's like, okay, I'm going to build this business, but the infrastructure that I'm building on the back end is going to be good for global. Hmm. I think, and it's interesting because in Japan, what was the name of that startup, Gengo, I think, that, they, that does the automatic translation? Mm-hmm. By definition, it's a global business. 
But if you go sit in the offices of some of these, you know, things that have Japanese names like the Ekiben or something, mm -hmm. you know, where it's like how to do food delivery for Obentos near the station. Exactly. And the name of it is Ekiben, right? So I just, I, I think that's one of the downfalls really so far of that ecosystem is that while there's plenty of money and the schooling's good and all those other things are good, it feels like very domestic to me mm. from, the, from the get go. Well, it's going to be interesting to see how Fukuoka develops because geographically it's right out there on a limb isn't it so it is if it is going to develop go native so to speak away from the influence of the capital tokyo i mean it's right out there on the westernmost point of japan nearer to korea and mainland korea. china right than it is to yep. tokyo probably so if it is going to have that international influence that's where it's going to happen it's going to start there so next time you're in fukuoka it'd be good to get an update and see if there's any sort of changes there right well, you'll, yeah, I mean, so the thing that I was thinking about over the past week when I was doing this research was what I really want to do is I want to reach out to this entire, this Fukuoka sort of startup scene, the whole startup cafe people, all of them, even the yeah. mayor of Fukuoka and say, look, you're doing this. It's a great job and it's a great vision. But what I want to offer you is some connectivity to the rest of the world. Because if you don't, you know, we talked about this and the general things that we had for what makes a great startup city. And one of those things is connection to the global infrastructure, right? So there's an airport in Fukuoka, but it's not gigantic, right? Now, there's a Shinkansen leak, so a high-speed train there. And that's actually pretty good. You can get to almost anywhere in the country relatively quickly or connect to another train that can do that. Like you said, it's on the ocean, so there's a port there, too. A lot of the, a lot of the things are there, but it's not a very global city. Right, and it does. It I don't know. I'd like to help it. I'd like to go there and talk to them and think about how can we get what you're doing to be impacted globally as a, as opposed to sim, simply locally. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I also want to talk about Singapore. In a way, like Singapore is the the elephant in the region to a certain extent. If for no other reason than they've been doing this longer than everybody else, and also, um, you know, there's so much money there, and there's a lot of risk capital there. It's almost like Singapore is the startup nation mm -hmm. to a certain extent, right? And you kind of – you think you know this before you get there and maybe it's because it's English speaking and there's a lot of banking there too, right? But there's some interesting things both good and bad about Singapore. We should just talk about some of them too, right? There are only five point something million people live there, six on the up, right? So if there's six million people there, I don't believe it's that many yet, but it's probably like five and a half million people. There are plenty of co-working spaces. It's almost like every coffee shop that's there is some kind of co-working space. But the Hive is there. Um, there's a place called the Working Capital, which is a great space. Workhouse, the Hub. Yeah, like I said, in some ways, it just feels like Singapore itself is just one large co-working space. Although, again, you go into some restaurants there, and I can think of a few off the top of my head, and the connectivity is pretty poor. Mm -hmm. right? So the internet speeds there are worse than they are in Japan and not much better than they are in Thailand, and I think part of that is because, at least from a Wi-Fi perspective, there's not a lot of competition on the phone space, right? Like Singtel and who else is there? M1. M1, right, but M1 is this kind of modern sort of MVNO in a way, I mean, not really, but the internet speeds there are 13.9 megabits, so less than they are in Japan, slightly harder than they are in Australia, and only slightly harder than they are in, um, in even in Bangkok. Now, from an educational standpoint, you have SMU, right, the Singapore Management University. you got the NUS, the National University of Singapore, INSEAD, so, right, so one of the most globally well-known business schools in the world. So there's no lack of educational opportunities there. But just to give you a sense for how prevalent just the whole Internet thing is and the startup thing is in Singapore, the – what was it? There was a recently announced venture capital company that they're calling Protégé Ventures, which is – the university's way of giving students the ability to make investments in other students via an infrastructure set up by other venture capitalists like Wavemaker, Wave Maker, VentureCraft, Marvelstone, TSR, the list goes on, right? But, I, and I think, I'm, I'm on record as saying, I think this is, not definitely, but I think the chance of failure for most of these investments are going to be bad. If for no, not because students don't make good startups. I think students make great startups. But investing is like a non-trivial business. <laughs> <laughs> and they're investing in their friends, right? <laughs> well, that's the thing. It's like, like investing in and of itself, no matter how old you are, is kind of an emotional um, yeah. 
<laughs> it's it, it's a, an emotional ride, but the younger you are, the less sort of in control I think you are of your emotions, and nothing against anybody in their twenties. But hey, Michael, I mean, come on, you know, like what what a, a refreshing change that is to some of the places we've talked about in terms of the attitude towards risk, right? I mean, you know, no, giving it's great. students, it's great. I think that's fantastic. Yeah, I don't think it's bad at all. I just think a lot of it's going to fail. But again, I didn't say failure was bad. Right, I yeah. just said I think a lot of those investments are going to fail. But again, it does teach people investing's hard. Um, don't just invest in your friends. Kind of like there are a lot of things to learn from it. Mm. And I think that's really important, right? But that's the sort of – it's just one of the ways to show like just how overriding is the the startup mentality is in Singapore. Um there's the corporate representations from a venture capital and from an investment side is huge. There's Temasek, SPH, right? So Singapore Press Holdings. Singtel Innovate, which is similar to what True and what AIS and what DTAC here do with their accelerators and their investment businesses. GIC, right? So which is the Government Investment Corporation of Singapore. Vertex, again, there are plenty of ways where corporations in Singapore have not just are participating but have been participating in the startup scene for a while. Now, what's really interesting to me, and I, in my mind, this is a double-edged sword. And I take flack for this, and I will continue to do so because of my opinion here. But the government has set up some pretty interesting programs, right? So the NRF runs – the NRF, which is the National Research Foundation, right, runs a program where they – not subsidize, but it's kind of subsidizing, right? So if there's a venture capitalist that participates in the NRF program and you have to apply to it so not everybody can participate – there is a filter there. They invest, look, I'm just going to make up a number, right? Like $100,000 of their own money. The government will match it. So the NRF will give you matching funds of $400,000. And you get to invest a much, um, in a much more leveraged way. It just means that a lot of companies in Singapore end up getting funded that may not necessarily get funded in other places. Right? So all the good stuff that's happening there, all the encouragement that the government, the money, the education system, even the culture of risk, there is skewed a little bit, I think, by just kind of too much money. Mm. You know, it's like walking in, it's just like, yeah, it's like walking to, a, you know, an auto dealership and all you really need is a Toyota Camry and, and kind of, you know, leaving with a Rolls Royce Phantom. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's just, there's a, a lot of stuff out there that gets funded that wouldn't get funded otherwise. And the other thing too, and I, I love Singapore, right? But the question is, what do you learn? This is one of the other questions we asked. And it's kind of the general questions. What do you learn when you build a company in Singapore? And let's just be on record as saying, anytime you're building a startup, you're learning something. It's super hard work to go from zero to anything close to one. Frankly, it's hard to go from, to, from zero to anything above zero when you're building a startup. So if anybody out there is listening from Singapore, building a company in Singapore, don't, don't misconstrue what I'm saying here. It's hard. It's all hard. But in relative terms, it's easier, one, because there's so much money there, but two, because the infrastructure, the airport, the banking system, all of those things help support building stuff. And that means that if you're competing with someone who's building their company in Jakarta or in Ho Chi Minh, which we haven't, they run up against some really stiff headwinds because of all of the difficulties and all the challenges that they face on a daily basis that simply don't exist in Singapore. And... While the financial market in Singapore is huge, the domestic market itself, even with the highest GDP per capita in Asia probably, it's just not that large. There just aren't that many people there. So there's a, there is some question about how easy would it be for a company from Singapore to expand into the rest of the region or to expand globally. We've seen a couple. Garina is one. It's been very successful, extremely successful. But if you look at e-commerce, which is one of the largest example, you know, one of the largest opportunities in the region, you can say that Lazada was based in Singapore, but frankly, that's a Thai and Indonesian company. That's where their biggest markets are, right? So again, it's a double-edged sword. And we talked about this before. Let's talk about cost of living. Mm. Again, it's about 2,654 Singapore dollars, which is about a little bit more than 2,000 US dollars. Um, just for a one-bedroom apartment. And let's just run through this again. I did a comparison between Singapore and Bangkok. Okay, the CPI, so overall, consumer prices are 63% higher in Singapore than they are in Bangkok. Including rent, it's 97% higher. Rent alone is 174% higher. 
restaurant prices. And I find this a little bit hard to believe because there are some restaurants in Bangkok that are very expensive, but this must be an average or almost 145% higher. Groceries are even. It's about 28% higher, but that's a push, I think. It depends on what you buy. And there's just the purchasing power. It's just 126% more expensive to live in Singapore, the local purchasing power, than it is in um, in Bangkok. Right. I don't know. So there, there's good and bad there. I think one of the, you know, one of the challenges in Singapore, with all of the assistance and all of the money and some of all the great infrastructure there, is that it's just a small place. Mm-hmm. On top of that, you also have that going back to that whole thing that we talked about with Sydney and Hong Kong. I mean, Singapore is the de facto port of call for all the regional head offices isn't it i mean especially yeah, if you create you know any advertising agencies based out of singapore yep so you know why would i go and work for an e-commerce startup when i can get a, a six-figure salary plus working here you know as a as an office manager or head of office for this ad agency right and a pretty safe job they'll never kick me out etc cetera, etc cetera. so it, right where do they get the talent that's the key isn't it i mean if 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 the best talent goes to these safer industries, then obviously that's an issue for startups, right? Absolutely. I mean, imagine a Singaporean student who's done ex- excessively well in school goes to Stanford to get an MBA, right, which is expensive, regardless of how much money your family has. It's just an expensive proposition, probably $100,000 a year. Um and then they come home. Now, remember, there's a lot of family pressure is, is very strong in, in Asia. I think as a non-Asian yeah. person, I think it's okay to say that. And that's not a bad thing. It's a great thing. What it means is, and we used to hear this in Thailand, you know, if you have a chance to go work at an MNC, like why wouldn't you take a job at Coca-Cola or at Unilever or at P&G or at one of the large drug companies or one of the large insurance companies? Why would you go work at Lazada? Mm. It's hard, Right. These are great companies as well, but the idea is, you know, your mom wants to brag to her friends about where yeah, you're working. Yeah, yeah. You know, you know, my my daughter went to Harvard to get her MBA, and now she's working at I I don't know I don't know what they do kind of thing. Right, and she's not <laughs> a doctor, she's not an accountant, but she she should be working at a big brand. A recognizable right. brand, right? Yeah, like she could have been working at Bangkok Bank or SCB exactly. or. Something I don't know where she is, but she tells me she's doing well, and I, I don't know. And she's now selling flowers on the internet? What the hell's going right. on? <laughs> right. So there is that cultural thing, and I think the yeah. same thing is true in Singapore to a certain extent. And like you said, if you could go work at WPP, why would you go work at an online, I mean, a, a, a new ad tech company? It's hard to explain to your family. I'm not saying you shouldn't. I mean, frankly, I think you should. That's my, my whole life centers around new companies. And encouraging people to do that. Right. Um, but it's easy to say, isn't it? But family pressure, peer pressure is very strong. strong. Same here in Japan. You know, why the hell do you want to go and work for a startup when you could be a doctor? You know, yeah, exactly. What, what's wrong with you? I mean, that's the attitude, isn't it? Because I think, you know, we can talk about the life opportunities, the learning opportunities, but still for young people, I think working for a startup, you know, it's not as cool as it could be in other countries, right? It's still seen, I don't know. I mean, I think in some cases in these places, maybe Singapore, especially here in Tokyo, it's like an alternative lifestyle. It is. I say that in the pejorative, you know, like becoming a a vegan or a hippie. (laughs) You know, it's not sort of accepted like, you know, in San Francisco, if you work for a startup, it's like, you know, that's... That's how it is around here, right? I think it's I think it's reverse. Like I think if you if you're in San Francisco and you're working for like Merrill Lynch, people are like, "What's wrong with you?" You're right. Yeah, did, exactly. did, like, have you read anything recently? Are you living yeah. in a cave? You just go from Merrill to a cave every day. Like, what's your deal? Bank of America. I don't understand. Yeah. yeah, but out here it's different. I think. But that's a big thing, isn't it? Because that that's the sort of the soft factors we don't see written down on paper, but have a huge impact on the shape of the ecosystem. I think. I think it matters. Look, I wanted to talk about Hong Kong too. So let's, why don't we just run through Hong Kong quickly and then we can kind of sum up some stuff, right? Hong Kong as well has 7.3 million people. The question to me is, you know, we talked about what's its full market size. Is it really building things that it's then sending into China? Yeah. Or is China building its own? Like, what is it? I don't, I don't really have a feel for what Hong Kong is these days. As, a, you know, as it relates to what its market size is, right? 
because you you know for sure that you know if it if it's built in Bangkok it works it works in the rest of Thailand if it works if it's in KL it's in the rest of Kuala Lumpur Jakarta it's in the rest of Indonesia the same thing in Vietnam Manila for the Philippines it's just all over the countries and it thinks about going regional and then going global but to me it's just not clear in Hong Kong you know I think the most successful company that I know and I'm going to get in trouble for this right because. I just don't I don't know for sure, but I think it's Lala Move, right? So Lala Move and there was Hip Fan and a couple of other companies that came out of Hong Kong, but you just don't hear that much. And I really strongly believe that it's because of some of the things we mentioned earlier. But anyway, let's let's just go through some of the other stuff here, right? Um co working space is plenty. You know, the hive is there again, we work is there and there are, I think there's something called the hub or the hub spot, but they're also building their own venture capital company, which is interesting, but hasn't really seen that work so well. Internet speeds are kind of middle of the road, 16.8 megabits per second. Universities are good. University of Hong Kong, Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, so that's okay. But from a corporate venture capital perspective, it's a little bit thin, right? I mean, Alibaba mm-hmm. is an entrepreneur fund out of there, but is that really a corporate? It doesn't seem like it to me, mm-hmm. right? It feels a bit, It feels a bit sparse to me. It's the thing with Hong Kong, isn't it? What what it is on paper, what it is when you go there, it, it's different, isn't it? It's you know Hong Kong on like paper it. is just different. It's it's just very you know it's many many zeros after the fact, huge financial market. But you go there and it's all the sort of the street hustle. You don't see sort of that tech scene that you'd expect to see there, right? No, and this is really going to get me in trouble. I think. Go on and say it. But but. <laughs> But Hong Kong is not even like a real it real is the wrong word. Hong Kong is not so much of a city as it is just like a really big town mm. with really high buildings. Ouch. Yeah, but I don't mean it that way. It's not it's not a bad thing. Like it, yeah. it, the point is that the main part of Hong Kong is really small. Yeah. You know, like going from Lan Kwai Fong to Wan Chai or mm. to the west side, just not that far away. And even going sort of to the other side of the island is just not that far away. The south side of the island is just not that far away, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm just trying to get some statistics on, you know, what it costs for a Hong Kong apartment. Yeah, it's saying 44 divided by 8. It's like $5,000, $4,000 a month for an apartment it's for three bedrooms. So, yeah, it's probably like two to $3,000 a month for a one-bedroom apartment in Hong Kong. And you see stories coming out of Hong Kong, right? Besides the fact that they're reclaiming land all the time and auctioning off that reclaimed land to build massive apartment buildings there, it's, a, again, a very expensive place to live. Yeah. Right? But, but again, then you wake up one day and then the RISE conference is there. So there must – and the RISE is one of the biggest conferences that gets done in Europe, as you would know, um, way better than I would. But I just wonder why. Mm-hmm. It's not there because of the local startup system. It's our ecosystem, really, is it? It doesn't seem like it to me. It doesn't be. seem like, but even even from a language perspective, right? Like, from a cost perspective, I think between Singapore and Hong Kong, it's not that big a difference. Mm-hmm. Um, I know they want to have kind of the China connection, but again, the relationship between China and Hong Kong has always been strained. Um, and Singapore is kind of like this Goldilocks economy when it comes to its relationship with China, since it's a Mandarin-speaking country. But it's not next door to China, but the relationship with China is strong because a lot of the businesses are run by Chinese people. So it's just interesting to me when you build like one of the biggest conferences in the world in a hmm. place where there's not that big of an ecosystem. There's a lot of money there too. But again, you know, you look at what Li Ka-shing does and you look at what some of the big groups there do and not a lot of it gets spent on startup. A lot of it gets spent on manufacturing and also on building their banking and real estate businesses. So it's the same type of problem as if your family is running – I mean, look at Richard Lee, right? Lee Cushing's son. I mean, he's closer to my age than he is to sort of the next generation. But, you know, they are, they're, they're building lots of resorts in Japan. They're in the real estate business. They've been in 3G sort of mobile businesses for a long time. But I'm not convinced that Hong Kong is going to be a hotbed for startups no. either, even though it has some of the right components, right? But even, again, just because you have some of the right components does not necessarily mean you're a great startup city. It's nearer Tokyo than all the others, I think, isn't it? In terms of the, the makeup, you know, in terms of it has some very strong incumbent industries, a lot of temptation to go and work for a safe bank 
investment bank or real estate, then go work for a startup. And then there's the cultural thing on top of that. So I think, you know, if we had a sliding scale, it would be up there with Tokyo at that end as opposed to Bangkok on the other end, right? Yeah, and what's your view on like the risk taking in Hong Kong? I mean, it seems like people there like to take risk, right? Right. I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, if you walk around, like if you walk around the main island, walk around Wung Shan or Shang Wung, whatever, and you see all those, the, the Chinese stores with their, you know, their, their storefronts out there selling their dried squid and their whatevers. You see that real hustle, don't you? That's the real thing you get from Hong Kong is that real hustle, that sense of energy. So there's some kind of entrepreneurial activity there. But, you know, when that sort of, when you take that to the other more established industries, it seems that everybody seems to be focused on finance or real estate or whatever. You know, I, there's a real gap. I don't see anything in the middle. I don't see anything that you would, you know, if you went to Bangkok, you saw people building e-commerce startups or you saw people building retail startups or infrastructure startups. I don't see any of that in Hong Kong, right? So I don't know. I mean, I don't see it. Maybe I'm not aware of it, but I don't see anything there. No, I don't see it either. I, I and and I've I haven't been in Hong Kong in like a year or so, but even the people that I talk to that invest from there, most of their investments are either in China or in the rest of Southeast Asia. Right. I mean, why why would you set up an e-commerce startup when you can just go and build a factory in Shenzhen, right? Right. So that's the other thing make, too. Is make if you ten look times at, the money. Right. If you look at some of the wealthier families there, their investments are in next generation factories and manufacturing in China. And if they're not doing it in China, they're taking the experience that they've gleaned by building those factories in China initially and then going and building them in Vietnam or in Myanmar or in Cambodia. So, Do you think a lot as well, I mean, a lot of the people that are in Hong Kong are expats that have been moved there by corporations. It hasn't really invited in the the startup entrepreneurs like, for example, you see in Bangkok or maybe Chiang Mai. You know, the people that live there have come with, you know, the, the, the finance brands and the 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 banks and so on right you know they haven't come there to set up a, a startup right no so you, you don't have that natural grassroots scene do you no and again so the airport's close that's easy to do and all those things are great but the reality is that from building a startup it's not a great place to do it i don't think whether you're a local or whether you are a foreigner i just don't think it's a great a great place to do it yeah and again the exit's there so you can have, you can monetize it by listing on the hong kong stock exchange and stuff but still, it's just not a great place to do it. There's so many other ways to make money in Hong Kong, and there's so many other, and there's so much competition from building companies in China, where literally across the border, like the wages and all the other things are just so much more affordable. It just doesn't make much sense. And Hong Kong, as well, is very expensive to live in. Yeah. All right, Michael. Quick one. Um, here's your get out of jail card. Which cities have we missed tonight which should be in the list which may be featuring another <laughs> episode but just in so case you know don't just Ho lift Chi them alphabetically Ho but Ho, Ho Chi Minh right I mean right, yeah. you, you got to you got to go to Vietnam it has incredible things happening to it but even Chiang Mai Phuket Kuala yeah. Lumpur we didn't talk at all about Seoul or Manila or Yangon where things are starting to happen and don't forget about Phnom Penh and Siam Reap and then Jakarta obviously is huge mm -hmm. Yogyakarta is big and and bali as well um those are just some of the countries that we just didn't i mean some of the cities that we didn't get a chance to talk about all of which have their own sort of good sides and bad sides i just want to talk about five sort of very different and differentiated cities just to give a sense for what's going on and the types of things that you know that we think are important in building that ecosystem going through that list that we had at the beginning um all of these things i think are really important and i don't think any particular combination works better right so a whole bunch of great things happening in Singapore, but it's a small market. Mm. Whereas, you know, to me, what's happening in, you know, Ho Chi Minh can't be discounted even though it's early, but again, a very domestic market. And Bangkok to me seems like, I don't know, just a lot of interesting stuff going on here. But yeah, I didn't want to leave at any place out, but we only have a limited number of time every week to, to talk about stuff. Now, I wanted to talk about one more thing. Um, we talked, since we talked about it a few weeks ago, right? We talked about, Amazon buying Whole Foods and what the impact was going to be on Asia. And we always talk about what's the big surprise. And one of those big surprises is for me has always been, you know, the food businesses and the food delivery service, right? Now, you know that, you know that Blue Apron did an IPO, what is it now, two weeks ago? Mm -hmm. they, priced that, they priced the IPO at $10. 
And I think it was either just before or just after Amazon announced that they were going to do the whole foods business. So Blue Apron, you know, is a packaged foods business. They take, they just basically take enough food for one human to build a recipe, right, and make it for themselves, and then they can sp- splice it up or, or add on to it. So one for me, one for you, you know, one for your kid or whatever it is. But there's no waste there. So you buy just the right amount of food. They deliver in a box. It's really nice. You make your food. You're done. You throw the box away, and everything's easy, right? Um, so for people that don't want to do the shopping and definitely don't want to measure things out and don't want to waste, Blue Apron was a really good opportunity. And frankly, I was on the phone with my brother last week, and he was saying, oh, honey, Blue Apron just arrived. Let's let's cook that up. So it's a real business. But the IPO, IPO to 10, it, it closed at $6.59. So it's down 35% from its initial trading price. And I know you can go back and look at Facebook. Facebook was down a lot too. Snapchat was down a lot as well. A lot of these companies priced too high. But in with the specter of Amazon owning the food and owning the last mile delivery and owning the infrastructure and warehousing knowledge to be able to deliver this stuff, I, I just don't know how they're going to compete. So now, 659, do you, you don't think it's a good buy? I, I don't know. I don't, you know, I can't, I can't, I can't presume and I can't guess what's going to happen in the public markets, right? Because I just don't have enough information. But I will say this, unless Amazon buys them or Instacart buys them or someone buys this company as a standalone entity, it ain't going to work. It's just not going to work. And I think if you if you paid $10 for the stock at the IPO, the only way you're going to make your money back, I think, is if someone pays a premium to buy this company. But again, that's not a big surprise, and that's kind of why I wanted to mention this, because we talked about it before it happened. We had questions, actually, from some listeners, what we thought about the impact mm. on the IPO was going to be, and it kind of did exactly what we thought it was going to do. I don't think it's good. Yeah, that's a good follow-up. We'll keep watching that story, and if people have any comments on that story or any of the stories that we talked about, they can tweet us. They can tweet us at Asia Tech Pod or use hashtag Asia Tech Podcast. You directly at where, Michael? At Michael Waits. Exactly. They can get us on Facebook, Facebook slash Asia Tech Podcast. Anywhere else? Yeah. YouTube. You can see we have we have a YouTube page as well. So look for exactly. us on Asia Tech Podcast on YouTube as well. Exactly, and don't miss out on every... We publish a, an issue every week, a new live show. Get on our newsletter. So if you go to our website, sign up for our newsletter. Get on the newsletter. You'll get an alert of when we go live and what we're going to talk about so you can get a heads up on that and join us for our live call. Yeah, and I want to thank all the people that um, keep contacting us and asking us to talk about particular subjects. We really appreciate it. You know who you are. Um, and even for those people who want to get on the show too, we really appreciate it. Thanks, Graham. You've been listening to Asia Tech Podcast. Find out more at www.asiatechpodcast.com.